Of all the world's intelligence agencies, there are perhaps none so controversial as Pakistan's Inter-Services Intelligence, better known as the ISI. All at once, the ISI makes its way through the world by cultivating fractious relationships with China and Russia, with the United States and Europe, and with known jihadist organizations at home and abroad. It's a friend and key ally to world governments one day and a bitter enemy the next, with such sway over some of the world's most troubling actors that they know, eventually, even the most upset global nation is going to come back asking for favors. Even in Pakistan, it's so controversial and so fiercely independent from regulation that it's been described as a state within a state, operating with impunity and nearly impossible for Pakistan's government to rein in. In today's installment of our Special Operators series, we're going to go deep on this most notorious agency, exploring how it works, how it rose to a place of such global importance, and how it extended its influence all around the world. The ISI, like all institutions in Pakistan, can trace its history back to the 14th of August 1947, the day that Pakistan was granted its independence by the British Commonwealth and thrust into statehood. In the chaos and the violence that followed, every element of the Pakistani government had to invent or reinvent itself and immediately move into a war posture and try to fortify itself against India, which had received its own independence just one day after Pakistan did. The ISI was established less than a year after independence in 1948 in an attempt to get some sort of intelligence service up and running during the first Indo-Pakistani war. Fought over the border region of Kashmir, which if you're not familiar is rivaled only by Korea's DMZ as a perpetual global flashpoint, the war was yet another bloodletting for India and Pakistan. With over 26,000 people killed or wounded in the fighting, the matter was resolved with the help of UN mediators in 1948, with a resolution that made neither side happy. But the conflict had also had a side effect in generating a whole lot of military intelligence from Pakistan's army, navy, and air force that the government had no way to organize or use in a coordinated way. In this setting, Pakistan had no time or ability to carefully assemble a dedicated intelligence service, so instead it had brought together intelligence officers from all three branches of the military. In fact, this is where the name Inter-Services Intelligence comes from, in that each officer or agent of the ISI is also a member of one of those branches. Technically, on temporary assignment in this new agency and expecting to return to their regular service at some point, these officers began the hard work of collating and acting on sensitive intelligence, and despite the rather slapdash approach and the hard circumstances in which they'd been brought together, these officers were largely successful. After a ceasefire was declared in 1949, the ISI became an important part of Pakistan's future, and when it came time for Pakistan to stretch outward and form its international partnerships, the ISI was a main subject of concern. Pakistan aligned itself firmly to anti-communist forces, and at that moment in time, so early in the Cold War, the ISI was seen by major anti-Soviet nations as a golden opportunity. The ISI received significant direct training from the West in hopes that it would become an intelligence bastion in Southeast Asia and one that the West could basically build from the ground up. Of course, the ISI, like all of Pakistan, was far more concerned with India as a potential enemy than the Soviet Union, but they benefited from the training all the same. In 1958, Pakistan was brought under the control of a military coup, and amidst the domestic turmoil that coup had brought, the ISI was brought into the fold of domestic intelligence as well as foreign. Pakistan's Pashtun, Bengali, and Sindhi populations, among others, had begun to chafe at the central government's authority. And because of the rather arbitrary borders that had been left behind at the end of the British Raj, some of these minorities were more interested in separatism than reaching a settlement. The ISI took a leading role in trying to stamp out this dissent, setting up internal surveillance on persons and groups of interest, but also infiltrating or coercing members of each independence movement in order to slowly bring them back under the military junta's control. Under the junta, criticism of the regime was tantamount to treason, and it was the ISI that played an outsized role in prosecuting that treason wherever they found it. However, their dedication to domestic politics often bordered on tunnel vision, so consumed were the ISI with political affairs that, during the Indo-Pakistan War of 1965, they were utterly unequipped to monitor Indian movements during the conflict. This single-minded dedication to upholding the junta backfired for ISI in 1971, when the junta collapsed in the face of East Pakistan's succession and transformation into modern-day Bangladesh. But the ISI's disgrace 
wouldn't last long. Within a year, they'd be working to assist the government in building nuclear weapons, and not long after, they'd play a leading role in intervention against an uprising in Pakistan's Balochistan province. With this renewed purpose, the ISI continued to accrue its power, and when the Soviet Union invaded Afghanistan in 1979, the ISI was primed and ready to be the central conduit of the inevitable global response. During the invasion, international governments practically tripped over themselves to offer Afghanistan's local Islamist militias, the Mujahideen, financial and material aid. All that support ran through Pakistan, and more specifically, it ran through the ISI, who both oversaw transfers to the Mujahideen and offered direct aid to seven primary militias that made up resistance to the Soviets. That latter portion happens unbeknownst to the rest of the Pakistani military, but what was somewhat more conspicuous were the many new madrasas, religious schools, that popped up around Pakistan's cities and the regions close to Pakistan. This would turn out to be particularly important, so we'll really spell out the connection here. <clears throat> so, what do schools, including religious schools, produce? Well, that would be students. And what's the Arabic word for students? Well, that would be talib. And what do you call a bunch of students all gathered together? Well, that would be the Taliban. By orchestrating this sort of large-scale education, the ISI oversaw the flow of thousands of foreign fighters into Afghanistan, accompanied by many thousands of tons of ordnance. The ISI took on a direct coordinating role above the Afghan Mujahideen, ensuring that their defense of Afghanistan went fairly smoothly, despite the potential for factorial rivalries. And by 1989, the ISI was fully vindicated. The Soviet Union withdrew that year, leaving the ISI massive amounts of newfound experience in covert warfare, a legion of proxy fighters, and an entire neighbor nation that was indebted not just to Pakistan, but to the ISI itself. Those proxy fighters, by the way, have had a nasty habit of popping up in support of insurgencies in the Kashmir region ever since. The Soviet-Afghan war had also made the ISI a key ally of Western intelligence agencies, most importantly the American CIA. The CIA provided direct training to ISI personnel in the United States during these years, and even dispatched their own agents and attaches to Pakistan to advise the advisors that were advising the Mujahideen. The ISI also helped the CIA conduct surveillance over the Soviet Union using its U-2 spy planes. But as much as the CIA and the ISI were content to be bedfellows in the 1980s, the ISI has also shown a willingness to cozy up to and even directly support Salafi jihadist groups that the US has since become very strongly opposed to. Encouraged by the success of their proxy militia in Afghanistan, the ISI has since adopted a policy of financing and training a number of other militias. Not all are jihadis, but the ISI has demonstrated clearly that if an organization were to be jihadi in doctrine, well, that wouldn't necessarily be a problem. The ISI has been accused of creating the group Hizbul Mujahideen to fight separatists in Kashmir, helping to found the terror organization jaish e muhammad and the insurgent group known as the Haqqani Network, which spent years employing suicide attacks, rockets, and IEDs against Western targets in Afghanistan and carrying out high-profile terror attacks worldwide. The the Akhani network, in particular, operated from Pakistan's North Waraziistan province with impunity and even complicity from the Pakistani government, even as their fighters attacked US and coalition forces occupying Afghanistan. And this brings us to perhaps the most dicey question of the ISI's recent history. Their support for Al-Qaeda, and specifically Osama bin Laden. The ISI made no secret of their support of Al-Qaeda while working with the CIA during the 1980s, but of course, that was long before the group became associated with the terror attacks like the ones that occurred on September the 11th, 2001. Prior to the 9-11 attacks, the ISI were believed to be assisting with the training of Al-Qaeda operatives, and for years, as global investigators attempted to root out Al-Qaeda leaders hiding in Pakistan, the ISI was suspected of obstructing or even outright interfering with those efforts. Most contentious of all is just how much the ISI knew about Osama bin Laden's presence in Pakistan, although the ISI is not confirmed to have been aware of the presence. Also during its recent history, the ISI have undertaken a number of international operations, some of which we'll be touching on in a moment. The organization has supported Uyghur Muslim separatists in China's Xinjiang province, even despite Pakistan's relatively close ties with China. They've financed or assisted resistance efforts in Central Asia and the Philippines, and they've airlifted arms and supplies to Bosnian Muslims under attack by Serbia during the siege of Sarajevo. 
According to one of the ISI's former directors, Havad Nasir, who was removed from his post after stirring up international controversy by supporting extremist movements in Tunisia, Egypt, and elsewhere, the ISI has a long history of financing its operations via the drug trade. Speaking more broadly, the group has made it clear that no matter what Pakistan's official international partnerships might be, the ISI will remain willing to cross a whole lot of lines in order to continue support for its proxy forces and non-state allies. The ISI is a precisely regimented organization with a strict command hierarchy all the way from the director general to the office-bound pencil pusher. The organization is headed by a single director general who is almost always a three-star general in the Pakistani army, a lieutenant general if we were to be precise. The director general oversees three direct subordinates, each of whom are two-star generals overseeing one of ISI's three main divisions. The internal wing corresponds to intelligence operations within Pakistan, domestic intelligence, counterintelligence, counterespionage, and counterterrorism, with a specific focus on sniffing out separatists and dissenters in some reaches of the country where the central government exerts less control. The external wing conducts espionage operations and gathers intelligence and performs counterintelligence work related to the world writ large. The foreign relations wing is responsible for diplomatic intelligence and intelligence that directly impacts Pakistan's relationships with other nations. Each of those three wings are in turn made up of a series of subdivisions and it's here that the ISI structure goes from being fairly vague to being extremely specific. These subdivisions include things like the Covert Action Division, an extremely secretive force of paramilitary special operations soldiers who are routinely dispatched deep behind enemy lines to conduct intelligence gathering, sabotage, and raiding operations. They include the Joint Intelligence Bureau, which handles anti-state intelligence and tracks counterfeiting, and the Counterintelligence Bureau, which sniffs out foreign intelligence agents operating on Pakistani soil. The Joint Intelligence North Department is an entire division meant to handle the Kashmir region, while the Special Services Directorate identifies and deals with terror groups planning to move against Pakistan. The Joint Signal Intelligence Bureau is dedicated to Pakistan's border with India, performing constant surveillance and maintaining readiness to deal with attacks. The Joint Intelligence Technical Division, made up entirely of engineers and scientists, focuses on advanced gadgetry and other spy sh**, as well as chemical and biological warfare groups and a dedicated team to develop explosives. One subdivision, the Political Internal Division, was rendered inactive in 2012 after spending decades charged with preventing the spread of left-wing political ideologies in the country. In practice, that meant rigging elections to ensure that leftist political parties could not gain influence and to keep any one political faction of any ideology from gaining a controlling influence that might challenge the military's authority. The Political Internal Division has also been accused of torture, abduction, and assassination. The total size of the ISI has never been announced, but some estimates suggest that it employs up to 100,000 personnel, a figure that would make it the largest single intelligence organization in the world. This is in keeping with many expert assessments of the group, which consider it to be acting almost as a deep state inside Pakistan, pulling the levers of power as it sees fit in order to ensure that it can operate with impunity. Other estimates are far lower, closer to 10 or 20,000. But even if that is the case, 10,000 is more than enough to achieve the organization's ubiquity inside its home nation. In the last decade, the ISI has had its power curtailed somewhat. But as the world was reminded as recently as 2021, the appointment of a new head of the ISI seems to carry more weight in Pakistan than even the appointment of a prime minister. The organization is headquartered in Islamabad, in a sprawling compound that blends in with the rest of the cityscape. In fact, to hear Western visitors tell it, the ISI headquarters are unmarked and only minimally patrolled on the outside. Calm, sleek, and quiet, the ISI's compound lacks the conspicuousness of some global intelligence agencies while not being kept deliberately out of view like others might be. Instead, it's decorated with fountains and situated next to an unaffiliated hospital. It's smoothed into Islamabad's and Pakistan's broader texture, where, like the ISI's influence, the headquarters itself would simply be missed if a person wasn't looking closely enough. Unlike other intelligence organizations, the ISI's personnel are in many ways a transient and amorphous group. Its employees, at least in the modern day, come from both military and civilian tracks, with military personnel often joining on what is considered to be a temporary assignment while their regular duties are suspended. In practice, these assignments can last years or even decades. Civilians in some cases come in with the intent to be career officers. On other occasions, they're temporary staff or even contractors coming to contribute their own little something or other before drifting onward through Pakistan's 
public and private sectors. On the military side, personnel are generally referred to the ISI when uh, they show particular promise in their prior role, and there's not much to say about what precisely they go through during conversion training, except that they're brought through an ISI intelligence course. But on the civilian side, a prospective ISI officer must go through Pakistan's Federal Public Services Commission, which evaluates a candidate's intellect, their awareness of global affairs, and their knowledge of English. After background checks and interviews, all candidates are processed through a training process that lasts six months. We don't know much about what goes on there, but given that the ISI's training and personnel management practices were directly taught by the American CIA, it's not too far of a jump to imagine that the training for the ISI might look somewhat similar to what CIA training looked like in the 80s and 90s. There's no publicly available data on how many people wash out of that training, but for those who make it through, they'll next be sent to five-year postings where they work in the world of open-source information. That is to say, information that isn't kept secret or classified in any way. If these officers can get through their five years, they work their way up into the sensitive jobs where the real work of the ISI takes place. Although we've already covered the basic turning points within the ISI's history, it's worth taking a closer look at some of their more notable operations, either ones that they've admitted taking part in, or ones where evidence would suggest that they played a major role. As we do this, it's important to emphasize that Pakistan, India, the Taliban, and other regional governments have a serious, persistent tendency to play the blame game with each other on a wide range of issues, so we'll be constraining ourselves to only the incidents that appear to have strong evidence of the ISI's involvement. First, we'll go to their actions in the province of Kashmir, where the ISI has allegedly orchestrated a decades-long scheme to support Kashmir's local Mujahideen and wage a low-grade proxy war against Indian authorities in the region. This strategy has led to the creation of several militant groups, most notably Lashkar-e-Taiba, which perpetrated the 2008 terrorist attacks in Mumbai, India. American authorities believe that this support has gone on unabated since the 1980s, with Pakistan providing not just intelligence and funding, but direct protection for the militias that most strongly support Pakistan. Then we'll move over to far more recent affairs in the UK, where in 2021, Pakistani exiles were warned that those among them who had spoken out against the Pakistani military were now under direct threat from the ISI, which was, according to the UK, a plan to attack those exiles on British soil. In July of 2021, an East London man was charged with conspiracy with unknown associates in order to assassinate a Pakistani political activist. Other Pakistani political commentators have been warned of direct threats to their lives. In Europe and Canada, Pakistani dissidents have been found dead in bodies of water and leaked memos from within Pakistan suggest that the ISI has formed its own lists of anti-military Pakistani journalists in the West. Pakistani expatriates have only gotten more reason to fear over the last few years, and many now live in fear for their lives. But even despite the ISI's clear presence in many other nations around the world, we've got to examine a far more difficult truth for the organization. The mortality rate of their agents. Hundreds upon hundreds of ISI agents are known to have been killed in the line of duty, and there's no telling how many others may have had the circumstances of their death kept from the public. Often, the attackers in these incidents are also jihadis, but have ended up on opposing sides of the conflicts that pro-jihad groups often wage with each other, which are just as complex as any other on Earth. In 2007, a suicide bomber drove a car into a bus loaded with ISI officials very near to the capital of Islamabad. 28 people were killed in the attack. In 2008, four ISO officers, 14 policemen, and 12 others were killed in the city of Lahore at the city's ISI headquarters in a revenge attack by Taliban insurgents who had since turned against Pakistan. In 2011, a car bomb meant for the ISI exploded and killed 25 people, injuring 100 more, although the attack missed its intended targets and only injured one ISI officer. In the smaller town of Sukur, a 2013 attack killed four ISI officers. These are only some of the attacks that the ISI has been subjected to, often perpetrated by some of the groups the ISI has supported in the past, in a stark reminder that even the ISI plays a dangerous game while recruiting non-states, often terrorist actors, to its cause. At present, we can only assume that the ISI remains as focused as ever on its long list of enemies. India and its occupying forces in Kashmir, the quickly souring relationship between Pakistan and the Taliban, and a long list of Pakistanis around the world trying to call into question serious government overreaches that quite frequently involve the ISI themselves. Whether the RSI will deal with these new challenges in their typical fashion, by raising funding and training militias to fight for their cause, or whether the organization will continue to evolve with time, remains to be seen. But regardless, the ISI is all but guaranteed to keep its notoriously entrenched place at the center of a highly controversial government. 
That government lords over a major regional power sought after by two global superpowers in the US and China that may soon find themselves more and more at odds. And stuck in the middle, Pakistan's ISI makes up a major part of a region that is itself a powder keg, still waiting for its moment to blow.